אוקיי, גוד מורנינג, שבוע טוב. Our show today would be about רבי צבי הירש אשכנזי, who no one knows as רבי צבי הירש אשכנזי, but he's world famous in the name חכם צבי. Now, how someone that is אשכנזי became חכם צבי is a major and interesting part of this show. And Chacham Tzvi, who lived for 60 years, between 1658, there is some debate as always when exactly he was born, but if we want it to be you know, around the dates, then it's 1658 to 1718. So these are exactly 60 years, and the major part of the second half of the 17th century. And in many aspects, he's being considered as we may say the precursor for the rabbi in the modern age, the early modern age, obviously, but the rabbi of the modern age. So he is, uh, in his days, the boundaries of Ashkenazic and Sephardic, of Torah and science are being uh, slightly or maybe even quickly uh, disbanded. And he is required to react in a world that is in many aspects different than the world uh, that he inherited from his uh, from his parents from the rabbis that came before him uh, and in that aspect is a very interesting figure another very important fact to know about Chacham Tzvi is that his son is the Yavetz Rabbi Yaakov Emdin now in some way or other we'd have to speak about Rabbi Yaakov Emdin uh, himself is maybe the <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I need to choose my words carefully, but he may be the most colorful rabbi in the 18th century, which is a hard competition. <laughs> uh, and one of the things that he did was he was very, I mean, the son, the Yavetz, Rabbi Yaakov Emdin, he was a, an extreme, uh, pro, that's a word that I always have difficulty with, prophetic or prophetic, which is uh, <laughs> pro, prolific, prolific, prolific. He was a, an extremely prophetic writer. Prolific. Pro Prolific. Prolific. Thank you. I know that the other one has a bad meaning. Uh, I, I don't know what it is, but I know it is a bad meaning. So, prolific writer, author, uh, wrote many, many safarim. One of them, many of them autobiographical in nature, meaning he writes about a certain topic, but he inserts his own personality. But one of them is uh, on purpose, it's an autobiography. It's called Megillat Sefer and in which he is also, in Hebrew we say soger uh, cheshbon, is, uh, how would you say it in English, is uh, closing all accounts <laughs> with everyone that he met during his uh, way in the Rabbanut. But he also writes about the history of his family. And when he writes about the history of his family, he is a great uh, uh, follower of Hasid. Uh, of his father, of the Chacham Tzvi, the hero of our uh, shoe today. So he dedicates three chapters of his autobiographical book to the history of his father. So we know a lot about the history uh, of his father. We just have to remember, as always, when you rely on an autobiography written by the son, that it may be that some things would be somewhat extravagated, some things would be maybe uh, less balanced historically, but he was a great writer. So also the stories are, are excellent stories. And the stories begin not with Rabbi Tzvi Irsh Ashkenazi himself, not with the Chacham Tzvi himself, but with the parents. So these are the grandparents of the writer, but for us, these are the parents of the hero. So the parents of Chacham Tzvi are Yaakov and Nechama. So we have their names, both the name of the father and the mother. And Yaakov and Nechama are young, uh, newly wedded couple in 1648. Why it is important that it is in 1648? Because as we remember, we spoke about that in the last few weeks. In 1648, the Cossacks rebel against the Polish uh, government. And basically, they begin to slaughter everyone, but uh, increasingly and mainly Jews. And it is not 
it is not an easy time. It's not fun to be a Jew in Ukraine or in Poland at that time. And at 6048 or two years later, 6050, so it's still uh, as the war is raging. And the parents, this new couple uh, of uh, Yaakov and Nechama are in Krakow, and Krakow is being attacked by the Cossacks. Now, Yaakov and Nechama split. Nechama runs to one direction, and Yaakov runs to the other. And the Cossacks catch Yaakov is being caught by them, while Nechama is able to run with her parents, they are, all, they are also there. Her father is a great rabbi, he wrote, his name Rabbi Ephraim, he wrote a book that is, is, in a way it's used to this day, it's called Shar Ephraim, Eshelot Vetshuvot, uh, so a very famous rabbi, and they are able to run away to Czechia, Czechoslovakia, to Merin, the, the Jews call it Merin, it's Morivia, so it's called Merin, by the Jews, so they are able to flee. But Yaakov is being caught. And the testimony is coming in that he was caught by the Cossacks. And everyone saw that a certain Cossack was going and catching every Jew that he was able to catch. And I, I'm sorry, you are eating, but he was uh, cutting, picking the heads off. And he was also, he also caught Yaakov. So according to that, the father of I mean, the, 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 the father of the of the wife, this great rabbi, he is asking one of the important authorities, Jewish authorities, legal authorities of the generation, to give an hater to his daughter to get married again, because obviously her new husband, her young husband, was killed in uh, in the war. And she's been granted a permission to get married. But now, all of this story we know from the grandchild, right, from the child of the Chacham Tzvi. So it tells, she felt that she's destined to have a line of great rabbis coming from her and her husband. And she said, it cannot be that he died, because they know that we are meant to have children together. So for six months, she's not being, she's not remarried. And then, as we say in Hebrew, Ba Haruk Beraglav, the killed person does appear. Yaakov appears alive and well, and he tells that he was caught by this certain Cossack, but for some reason, the Cossack decided to spare his life, and he hit him with the wide side of the sword. Instead of the sharp side, he hit him with the wide side, the kehe, how do you say that, the blunt. Right? the blunt side of the sword. So he only gave him a scratch and he told him, you Jewish dog, you run away. And he hid for six months till he was able, he, in the beginning he made himself as he was killed. And that's why there were testimonies coming in that he was dead. So, and, and he waited for the night to fall. And then he hid somewhere till he was able to find his way to his wife and they reunited and uh, continued their life. The rabbi that gave the permission decided he would not give any more permissions to Agunot. He said, if I was mistaken, Baruch Hashem, he didn't come to, to, to a new Hatuna and Mamzerim, chas but uh, because I was mistaken, I take my hand from giving any more Heiterim to Agunot, which is an interesting an interesting story. So this was the story of the parents of the Chacham Tzvi. So you begin to see the background in which uh, this person would be born into. So he's being born to this family of young parents that just were reunited. Two years later, he's not, excuse me, about six years later, he's being, reborn, he's being born. And he is, in the beginning, they live uh, they live in Morivia, as we said, in, Czech, in nowadays Czechoslovakia. And uh, the Shah Ephraim, his grandfather, the great, I mean, not the grand great father, but the grandfather who is great, uh, he is his personal tutor, tutor for the first few years of his life. So he is being given, we may say, the best education that family can buy. And then after a few years, a very interesting decision is being made by, by his father, by, uh, by Yaakov. Rabbi Yaakov sends his son, Svi Hirsch, so you can say Svi Hirsch, no Svadi, Hirsch. He is being sent to no other than Saloniki, 
to the great yeshiva there, there is a great Sephardic yeshiva there, because we are very Ashkenazic, I am sure that no one here ever heard about the yeshiva in Saloniki in the, in the 17th century, but it was a great yeshiva, headed by Rabbi Eliyahu Kobo, who was considered to be one of the greatest of the generation, and uh, Rabbi Yaakov decides that because in Ashkenaz things are so weak, and you can never know what would happen next, it's better for his son to get good Torah education, in a stable place. And Saloniki, under the Ottoman Empire, we have to remember, back then, the, all of the Balkan is ruled by the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire are on the gates of Vienna. And uh, so he's being sent to Saloniki to learn there. So he picks languages, Spadic language, he knows Ladino, he knows uh, a few pieces of Arabic, and he is able to communicate with Sephardic Jews. More than that, is being made aware that there are different communities with different minagim. Now, again, to us living in what we call the third, 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 21th century, that's a simple thing, right? That's a simple thing. That's obvious. Yeah, of course, there are different Jews coming from different places with different minagim. But if we are an Ashkenazic born, back then, and the farthest you went out of your village is like 20 kilometers, this was unheard of. Obviously, all the Jews are like me. I'm sorry to interrupt you because it's so funny. When I was 35, first, of, first time in my life, I found out that different Jews exist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we came to Bulgaria. I went to synagogue and I tried to speak to them in English. <laughs> Jews that cannot speak English, exactly. <laughs> so what make you Jews? Exactly. Exactly. So he was. So that was the mentality in Ashkenaz for let's say a thousand years. Right? So, so and suddenly things are being. I, of course, I'm I'm exaggerating a bit, right? It's, they knew the other Jews, but it was very. There was not very much communication. Maybe sometimes you read something 200 years after it was written, it reached Europe. But now he is learning in Saloniki. So he is picking up language, he is picking up methods of Torah learning. Now, if you remember from our last uh, two shiurim ago, we spoke about Rabbi Yaakov Israel Chagiz, who founded the yeshiva in Yerushalayim. So if you remember, in the Sephardic war, they were much more ahead in terms of modernizing the learning and putting it on a uh, firm ground. And while in Ashkenaz, people like the Maharal were trying to push things to advance the methods and style of Torah learning, and it didn't get much traction. In the Sephardic war, it worked much, much better. And so, as I said, Rabbi Yaakov decided to send uh, Tzvi Hirsch to the yeshiva in Saloniki. After a few years in the yeshiva in Saloniki, Tzvi Hirsch continued to learn in Constantinople, which is we call today nowadays, of course, Istanbul. And the Jews called it Kushta. So that's the much easier name. I would call it Kushta. So uh, he went to learn in Kushta and he was ordained by Sephardic rabbis. Now, by the Sephardic rabbis, you are not called rabbi, but you are called chacham. And that's why Mr. Tzvi Hirsch became chacham Tzvi. And obviously, he was called Ashkenazi. Why? Because you don't, they don't call you Ashkenazi when you live in Ashkenaz. Everyone is Ashkenazi. You are being called Ashkenazi when you come from Ashkenaz to the Sephardic world. So he's called chacham Tzvi Ashkenazi. Right? Chacham Tzvi Ashkenazi. And he, you can already see that he is able to bridge between different worlds. And he is, after being ordained, he is going back to Morivia. Uh, he is considered by many as a, already is, is known uh, as a Talmud Chacham, as an Ilui, as a great Rav, as a great Chacham. People send him questions in the age of 21 we already have answers that he was right. So people were sending them questions, sending him questions. Just try to think about sending questions to someone who's 21 years old. But he is uh, already known, well known. He is getting married. We do not know too much about his first wife. 
he had a wife, he had a small daughter. And after leaving, uh, after leaving uh, Saloniki and Kushta, he went to uh, what was called then Ufan or Alt Ufan. Now, later it was called Buddha, which became part of Buddha Pest. So we speak about Hungary, but Hungary does not belong to Hungary. There was not such thing as Hungary. It was part of the Ottoman Empire. Okay, so he goes to be a rabbi there. But the Austrians are now begin to try and push away the Ottomans back into Asia because we want Europea to belong to Europeans, right? No, but that's what they wanted. So they were in their journey to push away the Ottomans. And so there was a, a, there was a war, obviously. The Ottomans were not, did not want to be pushed away. And the Austrians are besieging Buddha. The Austrians are, be, are besieging Buddha. And unfortunately, a cannonball struck directly the house of Rabbi Tzvi, Chacham Tzvi, the Rabbi Tzvi Irsh Ashkenazi, killing both his wife and his young daughter. He was accidentally, that's what his son writes many years later, he was accidentally in another room. So he was saved, only the room where the bullet, the, 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 the cannonball fall uh, was destroyed. He was saved, but he lost his wife and his young child. He is, then he's, he's okay, that, that's enough for him. So he's running away, he's running away. And he is going to Sarajevo, which is called in the, if you look at the first source, excuse me, at the second source, uh, that's from the Megillah Sefer, from the, from the Yavetz, uh, says his son's book. Kasher ba'ir b'matzor, so he speaks there about, uh, about Buddha. Vayavo kadur shel esh mikane asrifa gadol shekorim, can you read it? Kanan. So he says, a, a big, ball of fire came from the cannon and it fell so it fell into the house of, of he says my father of Chacham Tzvi so the cannon ball take with it took with it his first wife and the daughter. And he writes it forty years later, and he's the son of the second wife. So it seems he's, uh, he's happy that his father was saved. I'm sure that Chacham Tzvi at the time didn't see it as a uh, It was a miracle. I, I'm sure that Chacham Tzvi was devastated. Sarai. Sarai is Sarayova in Bosnia. So he's still in the Ottoman Empire. He's running eastwards with the withdrawing Ottoman forces. Right, that's what is going on here. So he's now a Rav, Rav in Sarajevo. Unfortunately, the Austrians are not going to stop in, uh, in Hungary. They are going to continue to push the Ottomans east. And they are going to conquer all of, in the end, all of the Balkan. So uh, they, after a few short years, they are now besieging uh, Sarajevo. So Chacham Tzvi finds himself in the same situation. So you can just imagine uh, the feelings and uh, the pictures that are running through his mind as he's being besieged by the same people, the same forces. And uh, when he hears that, he is running away. This time he's not waiting in the besieged city. He is just taking his, uh, his uh, property and uh, the, the, what he could take, and he's running away. Now, while he's flying away, he hears that his father and mother, Yaakov and Nechama, you remember, they are still alive. They were taken captive by the Austrian forces back in Buda, back in Buda. And now he hears that they were released in Berlin. So they were taken captive by the Austrian forces and they saw, I, I don't know how, but in the end of the process, they found, him, they found themselves in Berlin. So he decides, he's now single, he decides uh, that he would reunite with them in Berlin. And he's walking away and his son tells him that's something that is going to be a hallmark 
of the Chacham Svi personality. He is not willing to take a penny from anyone during his road. He would not get gifts. And that, that is going to be very, very important because as we will see, the way that Rabbani make their living for a very long time in history were by being gifted. So people who donate money, you can call it in different names, but in the end, you would officiate marriage and you'd get some donation or a gift, uh, or there is, a, there is a nice word for that nowadays. I forget when you give a lecture or something and they give you something. And, Honorarium, thank you. Yes, honorarium. So that, that is, you know, when you call, call something like a cemetery, you call it Eretz Achaim, you know why you call it Eretz Achaim. So when you call something honorarium, then it's exactly what it is. <laughs> it's, it's the opposite of that. I mean, it's once again, oh, exactly. If someone is honored, then he's being paid in a fair way. If someone is needed to give an envelope beneath the table, then that's not of a great honor. And is he would have nothing of that. He is not willing to get any gifts. And he's, he's journeying. During his journey, he is becoming more and more known because everywhere that he would stop, he would speak in Limud, he would speak in Torah with the local rabbi. And the local rabbi, if he has a gram of, of, uh, of honesty and decency, he would uh, understand that he's speaking of someone that is uh, 10 leagues above him. So people, as, as he goes, people submit questions and begin to send questions after him. And we have a few questions that he was asked while he was on the road. So very, very interesting. In the end, I skip, I mean, we can speak here for five hours. Uh, uh, we need, to, we need to, to cut short. So he, he has a whole journey. And in the end, he finds himself in Ansbach. If you ever, let's say, met someone called Ansbacher. So Ansbacher is like Krakower. Krakow is something that came from Krakow, and Ansbacher is something that came from Ansbach. Ansbach is nowadays Bavaria. Bavaria. Mm -hmm. So he comes to Bavaria, and there is someone called Madel Ansbach. In Ansbach, there is someone called Madel Ansbach, which makes sense. And this Madel guy wants to marry his uncle. Not his aunt, excuse me. He wants to marry his aunt. I think he had a mother, his mother had a brother, and the brother had a wife, right? So he wants to marry this woman. I am not sure what exactly happened there. Was there just romantic love? I think it seems from some of the answers there that there was a great sum of money involved. Uh, for what reason it, it, it was, he was very much interested in marrying her, but there was one problem. He's not allowed. To marry his aunt. It's an aunt. It's an aunt. And thank you. It's an Isur de Rabbana. It's not a Deoraisa, but it's an Isur de Rabbana. So, according to the story of the son of the Chacham Tzvi, I am here going by, as I said, it's one sided. But he tells that this rich person, which again seems to have some also monetary interest in the wedding, so this rich person was bribing rabbis all through Europe to give him some kind of a hater to marry, uh, to marry his, uh, his, uh, his aunt. Um, yes. Uh, and, and, this, and according to the Chacham Tzvi, according to the Yavetz, to the son of Chacham Tzvi, he would, was succeeded in at least enlisting a few rabbis uh, on this list. And when the Chacham Tzvi went through Bavaria, through Ansbach, that, okay, so there is another rabbi, he's poor, he's coming from place to place. Obviously, he would accept a gift in order to give a psak, which again, you can, you, you don't have to call it bribe, right? There are other ways to put it to your mind nice. Let's, for example, I would hire you for five months uh, to do something, let's say, to, to teach my son or to teach my cousin or something and by the way i have a question to ask you would you please answer me and i would pay one million dollars in order to teach my course not just because i appreciate your teaching abilities right and because the Chacham Tzvi was already very much known this rich person knew that if you would be able to get the stamp of the Chacham Tzvi on the marriage that was that would be the end of the story but obviously he put his money on the wrong horse and the Chacham Tzvi uh, not only refused the money, but also make public that he was offered money in order to give an hater, by which he did, I mean, you can have a halachic position that 
well, someone is not married to marry someone, it doesn't necessarily make you into his enemy. But if you besmirch him and if you say yes and he tried to bribe me in order to get a hater, then uh, that's, as we said a few times, that's not the way to uh, uh, acquire friends and win influence. And, uh, and this uh, rich person became a, a great personal enemy of the Chacham Tzvi. He's not going to be the last one. And because that was the, you can already understand the personality. By the way, you can see that that's a line uh, and that, that's what it is, great. If we speak about someone 200 years after their lifespan, 300 years after their lifespan, then they must wear very strong personalities. And these type of people are not necessarily extremely diplomatic. Some of them are, but many of them are not. And he was not diplomatic. And he called the spade a spade. And if people liked it or not. And in this, uh, in this instance, uh, let's say that he had to leave Bavaria very soon uh, after this instance. The, the Yavetz writes in the Megillat Sefer, so again, the son of the Chacham Tzvi writes with, I must say, uh, a smile, I think. He says, so this rich person did marry in the end uh, his aunt, uh, aunt, but uh, he was immediately struck by some illness. They were not able to consummate, to practice the marriage, and he died in agony. Uh, a few a few years later, <laughs> so, <laughs> that, that's what is written. Uh, so and 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 this uh, is uh, he think that it's it, it's he it deserved it. Yeah, he think he deserved it. Anyhow, Chacham Tzvi continues and finally reunite with his parents, and everyone moves to Altona. Now Altona was part of a. A triage, triage uh, named Ahu, Aleph, Hey, Vav. It was very famous back then. It is Altona, Hamburg, and the city there is no way I'll be able to pronounce that is Wandsberg. Wandsberg. Altona, Hamburg, and Wandsberg. Now, Altona was, I think, I, I, I hope that I'm, I'm saying it correctly. Altona was back then part of, excuse me, of Denmark. And uh, and Hamburg and Wandsbeck were German, uh, it, it was not part of the German state, it was no German state, but they were, these were German city, like city states. So there were local princes uh, that were ruling the cities. And these three Jewish communities united, <laughs> they were Jews in order to save money, so they would hire only one rabbi for the three communities. And you know, you earn twice. One is that uh, the, the burden of paying the rabbi is being shared. And second, you don't have the rabbi all the time in your community because he has to travel. So it's a, you know, win-win to everyone. Now, uh, he got married there, the Chacham Tzvi got married there to the Rav of Ahu, to the Rav of this Altona, Hamburg, Wenzberg. So he was called uh, Rabbi, uh, Rav Meshulam Zalman Mirel Schneumark. Is uh, I, at least to me is uh, I, I do not know him I don't know anything that he wrote uh, but anyhow he was the rab of Ahu and he was very respected and the Chacham Tzvi became his son-in-law obviously in the thought that he would later become also he would uh, inherit uh, the position as the rab of Ahu for eighteen years he had <laughs> I, I am not obviously authorized to say that but I will I will say the best time of his life. So for 18 years, his father-in-law was still alive. He was given a cloise, you would say today, a coilel. He was given a coilel in Altona. And there was, it was completely held by uh, people from the community. It was part of the contract of his father-in-law that this yeshiva would be operated on the money of the communities. And he had yeah, the best students from all of Europe. Everyone came, they all knew that he is the the Gadol Ador, so people came to him, flocked to him, and he had, he had just a great time, because it's very different, let me tell you, between Talmidim in Yeshiva and Balibati. And there are many differences, but one of the difference, one of the differences, and a very a big one, is that you can say to Talmidim more or less whatever you want. It's part of the structure of the hierarchy, hierarchy in the Yeshiva, that the Rav, everything he says more or less is correct, and he would be adored, and, and his instructions would more or less be hidden, or at least on the surface they are being hidden. 
And if someone is not happy, it's just leaving, right? Because the yeshiva belongs to the Rosh Yeshiva. It's not the way it works in the community. In the community, it belongs to the Balibati. And the Rav can try to have his way or not. So as long as he was a Rosh Yeshiva, it worked perfectly. He was receiving questions, he was answering answers. He took responsibility on some of the kashrut aspects of the city. He made takanot. Uh, in the meantime, his parents moved to Eretz Israel. Very interesting. So his parents moved to Eretz Israel. It's, it's part of what we spoke about, I think, last week, that the Ottoman Empire united a, a large portion of the world. So it was very easy, it became very easy to travel, very easy, everything in proportions, but very easy to travel to Eretz Israel in contrast to what happened 200 years before. Uh, so his parents moved to Eretz Israel to, to live there in, 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 uh, in old age. And he became a little also involved in trying to manage the Jewish community, the Ashkenazi community in Yerushalayim. And it's a whole parsha by itself, again, can be a whole shiur. The way it worked was that people would send donations to Eretz Israel, and there would be the gabaim of the, in, in Yerushalayim that would uh, deliver, that they would uh, uh, deliver the money to the people in Yerushalayim. No one worked in Yerushalayim. If you come to Yerushalayim, it's in order to learn Torah. That was the contact. So you come to Yerushalayim, you learn Torah, and the people from Europa finance you. The problem was, again, and I am here following the, the, the Chacham Tzvi San, that the Gabayim were not really Gabayim, they were Ganavim. That's what he writes. So they took all the money to themselves, or they only gave to their relatives. We can see that. I don't think it's so far fetched. And, uh, and the whole of the Ashkenazic community in Yerushalayim fell apart. It really fell apart to the extent, it was not only the blame of the Gabayim. We cannot right now go into the whole of the, the, the story there. But the end, the bottom line was that because of the um, uh, financial commitments that the Ashkenazic community in Yerushalayim took upon itself and was not able to pay, all the Ashkenazic Jews were kicked out of Yerushalayim. That was the bottom line. The Sfadi remained because they were able to finance themselves, but the Ashkenazic, which, and not because of lack of money being sent in, but because of corrupt management, uh, they were just kicked out. And for about 100 years, no one could go in Yerushalayim in a grab of an Ashkenazic Jew. That's the reason why, by the way, some of the Hasidim in Yerushalayim I guess that you, you wondered about that. I, the, the Satmer, some of the Satmer in Yerushalayim are, are clothed like Sfardim, like all day Sfardim, the, the, the zebra. You know what I'm saying? The zebra, the, the stripes. That's not an Ashkenazic, that's not an Ashkenazic customer. How did they come to wear that? The, the answer is that you were not allowed as an Ashkenazic Jew to go into Yerushalayim, because, oh, unless you would pay the duties. Uh, so the way to walk around was to Sfardize. So these people, I mean, the parents of the parents of the parents, their ancestors, just uh, dressed as Fadi in order to live in Yerushalayim. So these were, these were the times back then. Uh, and the Chacham Svi tried to fix it, but was unable because, as I said, he was a very straightforward man. And it really doesn't work in the end. You need to be able to speak with everyone. If you call the Ganav a Ganav, then maybe you have the satisfaction of saying the truth, but he's not going to cooperate from now on. And that's exactly what happened. So in the end, uh, in the end, it fell apart. In the end, it fell apart. But in his city and in his yeshiva, he did great. He did great. And some of the great rabbis of the next generation would be his own students. He was, as, as I say, he was asked questions from all around the world. One of the famous questions, for example, that he was asked was about Yom Tov Sheni. As I said, travel became more and more uh, pri prevalent yeah. and uh, a prevalent practice. And people would begin to ask about Yom Tov Sheni. So I visit Neret Israel, I'm there for Pesach, I'm there for Shavuot, I'm there for Sukkot. What about Yom Tov Sheni? And he is one of the first authorities that said, you know, Yom Tov Sheni is not about, it's not a personal minhag that you need to keep. Yom Tov Sheni is a local Takana. In the places where the Takana was enacted, you need to keep it, or whatever, if you are in Israel or not. If you are in Chutz Laaretz, you need to keep Yom Tov Sheni. If you are in Israel, you do not need to keep Yom Tov Sheni. That's the end of the story. It's not about Minhag. It's about the laws of the place. So that was his position. 
it was not accepted. As, as you may know, later authorities uh, disputed it. Obviously, it's beyond right now our scope. In the Mishnah Bura, that is not what is coded. In the Mishnah Bura, uh, it is said that if you are only a visitor and you do not live in Israel, you need to keep Yom Tov Sheini. There are other Minhagim as well. As you may know, there is what is called the, the Yom Vachetzi, right? Only keeping the Isurim, but not doing the mitzvot. So there are different ways how to solve this riddle of Yom Tov Sheini, but he's one of the first one to write an answer. It's very interesting. There were a few before him, but he's one of the first one to write an answer. And that is because, as I said, people were asking questions. He, he, he himself, as far as I know, never visited Eretz Israel. But people were asking him questions. Okay. Another famous question he has, that's a question he says that no one asked me, but I thought about. He says, my great, great, great grandfather was Rabbi Yosef Mechelm. That is the same Chelm that people have jokes about. But it was a very nice city, Chelmeno. And, uh, and so his great, great grandfather was Rabbi Eliyahu Mechelm. And he was a Mekubal. And he created a golem. That's the real golem, not the golem, the Maharal. I think I, I said that's a, that's a made up story. But he created the real golem. And the golem was able, according to the story, the golem was able to hear and to see and to act, but not to speak. But he became very aggressive. So in the end, Rabbi Eliyahu had, there was some type of, a, I guess, a, some, a, a note with the name of God a stuck to the uh, forehead. forehead of the creature, and, uh, and he had to take off this <laughs> note in order, to, in order to kill it. And uh, the golem resisted, and he injured Rabbi Eliyahu. Anyway, that's the story. Now, what is the question? The question is, can a golem join a minion? <laughs> it's very interesting. He said, I will think about Now, I know many golem we join to a minion, <laughs> but fine. So, uh, uh, so he writes, uh, he, writes, uh, he writes a question and he, he, he deals with it, it's very interesting, he, he deals with it. And in the end, he gets to the conclusion that the golem is not really a human being. Uh, you, in order to be a human being, it's not enough to have uh, two hands and two feet and, 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 uh, and ability to act. You also need to be born from a Jew. And if you were not born from a Jewish mother, although you were made, it's very interesting, you were made by a Jewish Bekubal. But we are not born by a Jewish mother, then you are not a Jew. Now, you can think about the outcome of such an answer to nowadays modern practices of uh, fertilization, right? What would happen if you take a, a cell, as they did with this uh, sheep, right? So would it be a Jew if you take the cell from a Jew? Would it be a Jew or not be a Jew? So it's, it's, these are interesting questions that sometimes, what was you know, fantasy? 300 years ago, he didn't think it's fantasy, by the way. He, for him, that's a, that's a valid question. Uh, it's hard for me to resist, although we are only in these first years, we have a lot to speak about. He's a fascinating figure. But one of the answers that later spiraled out of his answer was, it's, it's an interesting, uh, 100 years later, someone wrote a, a question about what happens if uh, you made a Zimun. So the story was, we made a Zimun and uh, later we discovered that the guy that made the Zimun, I think it was a golem or it was really a, a, a horse, I think that the witch made into a human being, uh, something very strange. Uh, so should we bench again? <laughs> so that's a whole genre of questions that, that he opened. Very interesting, very, very interesting. Uh, but you can see that he was interested in everything. That's, that's uh, in a few minutes, now that's, that's a bordering, obviously, a, 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 just a curiosity. But, uh, but in a few minutes, we will see that that became a major uh, debate. Uh, so, uh, in 1705, we are still in his time, is the Rosh of the Kloy, Rosh Yeshiva in Hamburg, and everything is, excuse me, in Altona, everything is beautiful. His father-in-law is, is the Rav, and he is, uh, and he is doing his own thing. In 1705, in London, there was a great Jewish uh, debacle, dispute, fight. Now, how Jews came to live in London? Maybe you remember that somewhere in the 30th century, Jews were kicked out of England not to be returned. And they were not allowed to be returned, but when uh, excuse me for some uh, some uh, uh, ounce of uh, English history. So if maybe you remember Cromwell. 
So when Cromwell became the dictator instead of the, of the king, uh, then uh, he was, and because of religious reasons that are not right now uh, to, be, to, be, to be explained, uh, he was, there was a certain rabbi called Rabbi, rabbi Menashe in Israel that was able to convince Cromwell, the Jews, uh, new converts, I mean converts, people that were converted to Christianity back in the time of the Great Explosion, I mean in the 50th century, and uh, the end of the 50th century. And now 100 years later, they should be welcomed to England. They are modern, they are they're dressed like modern people, so they look nice. They want to return to Yahadut. They cannot do it in Spain, because in Spain, if you were enlisted as Christian, that's the end of the story. You're not allowed to return to Yahadut. So they would come to England, and there they would practice the Yahadut openly. And Cromwell was convinced the law was not changed. It was not, the law was not attracted, I think, to the 19th century or something. But, uh, but Jews were allowed de facto to live in, uh, in England. So there was a Portuguese community in England. Now it's very important to understand the nature of this community. Think about a community that is all, all from the last, uh, from the last person in the, in the pews to the rabbi on the pulpit, all of them are Bali Tshuva. Because that's what we're speaking about, right? So all of them, all of them were born as Christians. Later, it was revealed to them that they are Jews and they are coming to England in order because they do not want to be Christians anymore. They want to practice the Yadut, but they know nothing. They know nothing. How, how would they? No, you cannot blame them, obviously. You cannot blame them. They know nothing. And they come, to, they come to England or they come to Holland also, to Amsterdam, and they begin to learn. So for many of them, they say, okay, we know nothing. And we know only the Torah Shebechtav. So we have a certain ideas about what Yahadut. Suddenly we, we are being, be, being aware that there is Gemara and there is Shulchan Aruch. I think that do not appear at all in the Torah Shebechtav, but fine. We know that we do not know. So we would learn and uh, everything is fine. Let's say 90% were like that. For 10%, it was not like that. They were very angry with the Yahadut they were being introduced into because that's not what they signed on. They left Christianity because Christianity was full of stories and things that did not make sense. And so they came to the Yahadut, which is supposed to be rational, and then the Torah should have And suddenly you come to them with, you know, with what we know from the midst of the Torah Balpe. And so just to, to throw names, or maybe some of them would be familiar. So Uriel de la Costa or Baruch Spinoza. These are all people that were former conversers and they came to Judea and they did not like what they find. So they become an engine of change because they are looking to change. They are looking to reformulate. Atheism is being born. Atheists, right, from these people. But Benedicto Spinoza, Baruch Spinoza, which is considered not only by the Jews, but also by, uh, by, by Europeans in general, by Christians in general, as the first, at, in a, obviously they were before him, but the first atheist that was, that put his opinions into writing in a very lucid form. He is one of these people, he's from Amsterdam. But that's the atmosphere you're working in. So in Ashkenaz, you don't need to speak about faith, about philosophy. You only need to learn Gemara. That's what they do in Ashkenaz. But in these communities, you need to bring the people into fold. And if you'd not be convincing, then you are in trouble. You're in trouble anyway. You're in trouble anyway. Now, one of the rabbis is Rabbi David Nieto. <coughs> Rabbi David Nieto. Rabbi David Nieto was an Italian, as you may hear. And so he was a, an, an, I don't know, an MD, BD, AD. I mean, he, was, he had 10 degrees uh, from many universities in Italy. And so he was educated. So the people in London said, we want someone that is not only knows Gemara, Gemara, Gemara. We need someone that is uh, educated. So they brought Rabbi David Nieto. And Rabbi David Nieto was beginning to teach. And he had, I me mean, he was big, big into Machshava. He wrote a book later named the Kuzari Sheini, the second Kuzari. 
So that's, that's, that's the, the type of person he was. Now, one day he gave a drasha in the shul. He, first he gave a shul in the yeshiva, then he was asked to clarify it, so he gave a drasha in the shul. And in the drasha in the shul he said that God is nature and nature is God. And these are not two different things, it's one thing. Now, again, it's not here, as we do not go into halachic details here, it's also not the place to go into philosophic details. But anyone that has any familiarity with the Spinozic heretical thoughts knows that what is called panatheism, believing that nature is God is really a way many times to do away with God entirely. Right? Because you say, okay, what we call God, when we say that God created the world, it's nature created the same thing, right? Nature wants, nature developed. So nature replaces God. And first, what it does is to erase uh, the personality, we may say, of God. So everything is very mechanic, right? It's nature. And then later you can do away with the whole thing. So it's from uh, monotheism to daism to atheism. And now I, I, I apologize that we, we cannot right now go any deeper into that. So people in the, uh, in the London community, the more from element, we may say, of the London community, they suspected that the rabbi is teaching heretic. Right? Because if you say that nature is God and God is nature, so what do we pray to? So they began to argue with him and they decided that they would send the question to a third party. Who would be the third party? Chacham Tzvi is the greatest authority, authority of the generation. And he's also known, he knows both the Sephardic world, the Ashkenazic world, and he is uh, well educated also. He, he has no formal degrees, but he is, he is uh, well versed. So we may send him the question. So he's being, uh, he's being sent the transcript of the drasha given in Shul, and he needs to give his askama, kosher or treif. So he writes, it's a fascinating word. So he writes an answer, which I quoted parts of here in, uh, in source Dalid. So you may see, it's a question, it's an answer to London, Lindon, London, Tibaneve uh, Tikonen, it should be built, uh, 1705, Taf Samechei, Taf Samechei, 1705. A question from the Parnassim Vamanhigim, right? From the leaders, from the lay leaders of Keilat Kodesh, Lundrash. Lundrash, London, Lundrash. Be Angle Taira. Angle Taira, it's the English of the, the, the land of the English. It, I think it's in French, Angle Taira. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah. so I think that's, uh, that's so I don't, I don't know why they would call it in French, but uh, so in, in England, uh, which are leading the Kahal Kadosh. Sha'arei Shamaim. Do you know the Shul Sha'arei Shamaim in London? No? Okay, maybe it does not exist anymore. I don't know. Uh, but uh, Sha'arei Shamaim in London, uh, and he gives the whole story. Again, I, I apologize, we would not be able to read it. But he himself, the Chacham Tzvi quotes uh, the Kuzari, that's the first Kuzari, and he says, you know, your rabbi told you exactly what the Kuzari meant, and that is not to eliminate God, Chas in favor of nature. It's to, when I say that A equal B, it either deletes A or it deletes B. So he says, no, what he meant to say was there is no nature, but everything is God, right? So what we see as nature is really the work of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now that is not a, a, a completely agreed view. Rambam would not agree with that. But Ramban more or less says so in his Perusha Torah. So that's a very conservative and, uh, and orthodox or form uh, view. And everything is fine. Now, did really Rabbi David Nieto meant exactly that? That's an open question. It's to this day. It's being debated by people that study, in university study, the drasha of Rabbi David Nieto. It may be that the Chacham Tzvi tried to give him a letter to went off the tree. Be it as it may, Rabbi David Nieto bought it with his two hands. He says, yes, that's exactly what I meant. Uh, that's exactly what I meant. And we would see, I mean, uh, maybe, I don't know what we would do. We would see, well, at the time is very short. It would, that's a gun that I am right now hanging on the wall, but it would fire on the third, as they say, uh, on the third act. So, uh, okay, so that's, that's, as I said, the best 18 years of 
עופר, עופר לחכם צבי. By the way, he had throughout his life no less than 16 children. That's counting everyone, even the, the first daughter that were killed. And I think five of them died, of the rest, five died again as young. We have to remember that that is the numbers of uh, infant mortality uh, in, uh, in those times. So from 16, six uh, did not survive uh, to, to poverty, as they say, uh, and 10 did survive. So you had 10 children all in all uh, that, uh, that grew up. So he is with a big family, but he's being paid nicely as the Rosh Kloys. Everything is nice. Again, he's not accepting any gifts. He is having his fights with the local rich people, but everything is fine because his father-in-law is the Rav and he is the Rosh Yeshiva and he doesn't care about the rich people. And then his father-in-law died. And his father-in-law died, so he wanted to become the Rav of Ahu, of Altona, Hamburg, Wenzburg. But he had enemies. Why? Because he was fighting with some of the people. He was fighting with other people. So in, in, uh, in Hamburg and in, uh, in Welsbeck, there, where he didn't live, it seems that he made less enemies. So they were willing to accept him as the rabbi. But in Altona, they were not willing to, being, it, was, uh, it, it, it was fractured. Half of the community wanted him, half did not want him. They wanted some other guy. The other guy is called Rabbi Moshe Rotenberg. Now, it is a com very complex story, very complex story, because I mean, we have to remember that underneath the surface, they are always accusing each other of being Sabbatian. Now, I didn't raise it up till now, but we remember from last year that uh, Shabtai Tzvi was the failed messiah in 1666. 1666, and he was he converted to Islam and later died. But many still believed in him being the Mashiach. And not only that they be believed in him being the Mashiach, he had different theories about the Godhead. And he had different, obviously making him part of it. And he had different theories about what happens to mitzvot now that Mashiach came. A hint, some of them does not apply, do not apply anymore. And, uh, and maybe even you have to do a verot. That's what he called a veira lishma. You had to do a verot in order to collect the sparks of light that fell into the world of the sitra achra, of the verot. So you must do a verot, such as converting, such as adultery, so, everything that you can think, really everything you can think about. Now, in Ashkenaz, in the normal Jewish community, we are not allowed to be a Sabbatian. But many were. No one can give you numbers because it was hidden. So how can we know? But obviously many were. And the son of this Moshe Rotenberg, who was heading the second camp, right, the other camp in Altona, the son almost for sure was Sabbatian. I mean, again, almost for sure. What about his father? We do not know. But it's part of the complexity here that we are speaking about. So the end of the story is that in Hamburg and Wenzberg, Chacham Tzvi is the Rav. In Altona, it's rotation. He's a Rosh Memshala Chalufi. Right? So for six months, he is the Rav. And for six months, this Rebbe Moshe Rotenberg is the Rav. Now, that's not a recipe for success. That's not a recipe for success. We, don't, we know that from, from, if you need local politics, then local politics will prove it to you. And if they're good fans, then that's fine. I, I was learning in the yeshiva, where there were two Rashi yeshiva, and they were, it was great. But they, they wanted, they were not rotating. They just did, every, each one had his own, you know, pina. But, uh, but they were not enemies. Here we speak about two enemies that you glue them together in order to make some type of a pshara, a compromise. And the whole thing was compromised. And... Again, to cut things short, there was a question that came up in 1709, and it became to known, be known as the pulmus of Hatarnegolet Lelo Lev, the heartless chicken. Now, I, I, I'm wondering what to do. It's two minutes after 10. I think that we have no choice but to push the rest of it because it's, uh, it's a whole, uh, whole parsha. 
so the heartless chicken, it's a, it's a good cliff to hang on. Uh, so we'd stop here, we'd stop here, and Emir Hashem, the heartless chicken will be the star of our next shiu next week. Thank you. Shavua Tov. Bye-bye.